Hi, I'm John Atak, and I'm extraordinarily pleased to be talking to Mike Rinder. And Hi, I- John. It's a, it's a real pleasure to talk to you again. Like like I said, well, I, I haven't spoken to you, though we've corresponded a little by email. I haven't spoken to you since I came to visit you with Warren McShane in Nottingham in, I don't even remember what year it was. It 90, was 90, 94. 94. Okay. <laughs> And uh, we he brought over one of the fancy fancy lawyers from um, Heller and Lensky, and, and oh uh, yeah, I, you know, I my, my uh, there's things about my life that I'd rather not remember. Yeah, and, <laughs> there and, was some very pleasant things about coming to visit you in Nottingham. I'm a huge cricket nut, so I had to go see Trent Bridge, and you know that that was like a, a saving grace for that trip. But other than that, it was like most of my adventures in Scientology. the The actual activities weren't very pleasurable. I mean, thankfully, we were able to turn that into something useful, which is what you've been doing for the last what thirteen years? Is it now since you left? Yeah, yeah, you know, it is 13 years. I mean, I've really only been speaking out publicly since 2009, which was when Joe Childs and Tom Tobin wrote the, the series that came out in the Tampa Bay Times, then St. Pete Times. And that was really my first foray into speaking publicly about the activities and abuses of Scientology, but I've been pretty relentless since then. You have, and um, you've contributed so much to the record that I, I approached you to just have a friendly chat, and, and you came back and said that I could have a no-holds-barred interview. And I thought, oh, okay. So I went to <laughs> Tony Ortega and Chris Shelton and various people and said, you know, what should I ask him? And they said, oh, he's such a nice guy. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be nasty to him. <laughs> And they said, "Well, I pay, I paid Tony Ortega and Chris Shelton f- to tell you that." Yeah, oh God, I knew there <laughs> Full was some disclosure. Ah, I knew there was something in it. Um, as far as I can make out, we're, we're very close in age. I was born in June 1955. Yeah, and I was born in April 1955. So I got your beat, but not by much. And I have to treat you as my elder and better, I suppose. As a there you go. Well, that no. would be that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> okay, well, I have I, to treat you as my younger, more handsome oh, uh, other side. Thank you so much. <laughs> your, your lying is 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 doing well at this point. <laughs> well, I'm well trained at it, John. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's true. Training routine, lying. Eh? What good fun that was. An amazing thought. Um, I, I wanted to talk about OSA operations. Um, yep. I doubt there's anybody who knows more about them than you. Um, I was absolutely astonished when I found out what the Guardian's office had done in infiltrating um, government agencies all over the world. Um, the, the full story has still not come out. I think Chris Owen will probably be the person who tells it because he's been to the the government repositories all around the world and read hundreds right. of, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents and found out things that I had no idea about. But this massive intelligence agency that was um, created by Ron Hubbard, um, I found out about that, and that sort of was a, a significant factor in my leaving Scientology in 1983. And um, then I came to see some of the internal documents. Uh, for example, the Information Full Hat, which is an 800-page uh, training manual uh, for the destruction of critics of Scientology. And it it just, I, I wrote a paper called um, Scientology Religion or Intelligence Agency, because it's still, I, I don't see very much that's religious in Scientology by comparison to other groups, but it seems to be this paranoid streak that Hubbard had that, that he was going to, I think he believed that he was going to become, you know, some kind of world leader. He was going to become something very significant in the world. And he was going to do this by beating the opposition down and silencing any critics. So I presume that at some point, did you do the information full hat as a course, or was it just something that, that you would refer to? 
No, I've never done the information full hat as a course, but I ha- you know, have done far more than that. I was the head of the Office of Special Affairs for nearly 20 years, and in the course of that, I studied, I think, everything that Hubbard ever said about intelligence, as he called it, or handling of enemies, or treating, uh, dealing with critics of Scientology, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that, that body of work... Your piece that you wrote, I thought, was was wonderful. And Chris Owen said to me, and I also have, have got to give a shout out to Chris Owen, who is the most remarkable researcher I think I have ever come across. And he said to me, you know, Mike, um, can you tell me any other organization that calls itself a religion that has an intelligence arm? He said, the only ones that I know of are Alm Shinriko, ISIS, and that's the end of the list, Scientology. He said, th- those are the only only three. And you, you just said, Chris, I mean, just said, <laughs> John, that Hubbard thought that he was going to become, you know, uh, the savior of mankind and some great leader in the world. And I think that that's true. But I think that there is something else that I have come to learn over the the time since I've left about cults. And that is that it is essential to have a boogeyman enemy. And, you know, while Hubbard tended to focus on psychiatry as the the boogeymen and the big enemies of Scientology. It was not limited to psychiatry, as you know. All government agencies, the media, the like people who had left Scientology, squirrels. I mean, the list is a very extensive list of the us against them world of Hubbard. And that us against them sort of mindset puts people into uh, a state of, of, you know, suspended disbelief of anything that is said that is critical or that is negative about the organization that you're part of. And, you know, we, we are seeing this today, and I see that Steve Hassan and Chris Shelton and various others keep coming out and saying, look, this the behave, the political climate in the United States has become cultic. It has become, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm not limiting that to Trump. I think it's also true on the other side of the equation. It, 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 it's become crazy. I, I, the other people are enemies. And they are to be destroyed. And that that mindset leaves you in a position where you believe everything that your side says and nothing that the other side says. And that that is almost by definition an insanity. You know, when you can't observe uh, the facts of what's going on, but have to reject things because of their source, then you have become insane. And I believe that that Hubbard sort of developed his his crazy we're going to destroy our enemies and use intelligence and etc cetera, etc cetera, out of that mindset that we've got to have a a, a them in the us versus them equation and the them you have to convince people that them must be destroyed or them must be discounted or they must be silenced or they must not be listened to as uh, a necessary part of establishing the following that you need to have to keep people giving you money and giving you the power and you know it's funny because I also I talked extensively with Chris about you know the 
the conceit of Hubbard talking about his intelligence training and his intelligence career, which was really being a cipher, you know, in in the uh, recognition of enemy <laughs> ships and planes being taught exactly. and, and censoring letters, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But he he uh, you know touts himself like he does in most subjects as the world's leading expert on intelligence and expounds upon it in enormous detail in these writings that are not broadly uh, available because they're so distasteful, but are nevertheless the, the playbook for the Office of Special Affairs and prior to that, the Guardian's Office, but, but but more than that, they are the playbook for the mindset of Scientology with respect to dealing with anybody that says anything they don't like. You know, you you talk about an eight hundred page um, information hat or intelligence hat or whatever it was called, and I knew that you wanted to discuss this, and I actually pulled out what I consider to be the two singly most important references that Hubbard wrote about conducting uh, campaigns against enemies of Scientology. And they are both written on 28 March 1972, and one of them is entitled Counterattack Tactics, and the other one is entitled Intelligence Principles. And these two documents, which I'm sure that you have, and if you don't have, I'm happy to send them to you. And I will, uh, you know, I covered these in a posting on my blog, which I called the, you know, dealing with the dealing with critics of Scientology, the L. Ron Hubbard playbook or something like that. Um, these, these two references, John, are the references that remain in effect to this day and are the handbook on how you go about destroying someone who is deemed to be a, an enemy of Scientology. And just so everybody understands, I, I'm sure that people who are listening to this are pretty attuned to the subject of Scientology. I don't think that we're going to get a whole lot of novices that know nothing about the subject. But nevertheless, I, I try not to just assume that everybody understands everything already. No, I, but, I've always presumed that there would be people who are coming along who had no idea about this, and so, you know. Yeah, so, so you know, but you can go too far in trying to explain every single little thing and never get any point made because all you're doing is explaining the arcane terminology of Scientology. It's exactly that. When I came to write a piece of Blue Sky, which is now Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, I looked at Cyril Vosper's Mindbenders and Kaufman's Insight. I looked at every book there was, and they all bogged down in saying, well, there are these things called engram secondaries and locks and defining them. You're going, well, there are traumatic incidents uh, registered during unconsciousness, according to Hubbard. And just get to the, the meat, because the terminology is, let's face it, 1,200 pages of dictionary that, right. from this guy who's saying, if you give people misunderstood words, they'll attack you. You know, and you go, all right, you know, why did you do this then? <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. But in any event, John, the, the, the digression I was about to go off into is what is an enemy of Scientology? Because it is not someone who is seeking to destroy Scientology out of evil motives. It is anyone who is taking a position, whether publicly in a court of law with, the, with law enforcement agencies in the media, which is not the accepted uh, toe-the-line position that Scientology wants itself portrayed as. So... Enemies of Scientology, and these are all people who are in line to be destroyed by Scientology, are 
anybody in the media who writes a story that Scientology thinks is one-sided or doesn't present just their view of things. Doesn't say Scientology is wonderful and Elrond Hubbard is Maitreya. Right. And, and even if they say that, along with bad stuff, that's enough. You, you, you don't even have to be all 100% bad. If you've got bad and good, then that's no good either. But there, so it's the media, it's government agencies that may be, uh, the charity commission in the United Kingdom is a perfect example. They refuse to recognize that Scientology provides charitable benefit to society, despite no enormous efforts to, to prove to them that that is the case. And so they are perceived as an enemy of Scientology. People who leave and speak about their experiences, their personal experiences, if those experiences are, are unpleasant or abusive or whatever, they are deemed an enemy. And, you know, people say, well, you know, how can that just be? Well, Scientology thinks that if you have a beef with Scientology, you should deal with it internally. So if David Miscavige has beaten you up and, you know, kicked you and put you in the hole and whatever, that you should go to the Scientology authorities, Wait, not like, that there are any other than David Miscavige, to resolve that and you, shouldn't you, air you it You do in the public. truth rundown to the point where you realize it was for your own good that he kicked you and threw you in exactly. the hole. That's exactly right. So... This is a very broad range of, of people that are encompassed in this idea that, the, that they become an enemy of Scientology by attacking Scientology. And Hubbard says in this counterattack tactics that those who attack Scientology have criminal or shady records and personal lives that are provenly suppressive. And this is another concept that Hubbard presented to, to Scientologists, that Scientologists buy into 100%, that anybody who attacks Scientology or is an enemy or even a critic has sordid crimes that they are hiding horrible, they're a child sex molesters, they're uh, perverts and uh, thieves and all sorts of things. And Hubbard even goes as far to say, you know, and if you don't know exactly what it is, just accuse them of it anyway, because you'll know that you can be sure that it's true. Yeah, he even brings in the psychiatric term right at the beginning, antisocial personality. And he conflates this with the anti-Scientologist. So you are right. a psychopath if you criticize Ron Hubbard, his wife at that time. You're allowed to do it now, I think, since you came out of prison. Um, but, you know, it, it's this bundling things together into the, exactly as you say, this black and white polarized thinking. There are no shades of gray. There are no 50 shades of gray, certainly. Um, and if you, you're either with us or you're against us. Is, that's all there is to it. And right. the whole and, agonized and future of every man, woman, and child on this planet depends on what we do here and now in Scientology. Right. And just to add to that, all those people are criminals. And this justifies doing whatever. And... There are no holds barred when it comes to dealing with the enemies of Scientology because those people, by Hubbard's definition, are seeking the destruction of mankind. And, and this is the mindset that a good Scientologist has. This is the mindset that I had when I came to visit you in Nottingham. Yeah, that here is this guy sitting across from me as mild mannered and as, you know, unassuming as you were and are. But this guy in my head is a, a, a person who is seeking the destruction of mankind. 
as crazy as that seems to me now, that is absolutely the mindset that Scientologists get into. And it's the mindset that every cult member ultimately gets into. The, the, the them in the us versus them equation are people who do not deserve to live. I mean, that's, that's really where it comes down to. You don't deserve to live because your living is threatening the lives of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, the, eterni- the, 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 the future of all mankind and all life and et cetera, et cetera. So, and that was, lo- of course, my intention at the time as I sat across yes, the table. Yes, I know, John. <laughs> From, from from your little house in Nottingham, you were going, you were going to destroy the world. Yes. I know, yes, I know. <laughs> but the the interesting thing about Scientology that you know, there's a lot of fundamentalist religion religion following people in the world, from Christians to Muslims to. Jews to atheists, any, any, any to atheists, you know, fanaticism doesn't have any boundaries. It's absolutely, something that people have, you know. Absolutely right. But there are always fundamentalists in every every one of those movements. Although I tend to say that Scientology, perhaps unlike uh, most of these other things, is all fundamentalist. Well, I disagree with you because when I was a member of Scientology, I didn't hold that view that that anybody who criticised Scientology was trying to destroy your life. I was even willing to talk to homosexuals, communists, journalists, you know, prescribed people. So nine years. I know, but you weren't a good Scientologist and you left pretty quick. I was a very good Scientologist because Hubbard's measure of a good Scientologist (laughs) is your ethics folder. And I only had, in nine years, three ethics negative ethics reports, and I had commendations. So by his definition, I, w- I never had a PTS rundown. I was never seen as that. I had the top auditor in the UK, Richard Reese, who was auditing Van Morrison at the same time. So I was squeaky clean compared to most Scientologists, but I never absorbed. And I think those it's important to, under- to get there are those levels of belief that many of the People on the outside of Scientology haven't got how fanatical they're meant to be. You know? R- yes, you're correct, John. I, I, I certainly shouldn't argue these these points with you because we're not in disagreement. And uh, you, you know, you know, uh, I was going to give a wise ass response and say, "Yeah, well, see, you're you're the you're the 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 violation of the rule that proves it." Oh, well, let's go back to Latin. The word is provare, and it means tests the rule, not proves the rule. In the any event. Tests the rule. So there you in go. Any event, it, 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 is, it is true that the fundamental, most sort of the essence of Scientology is keeping Scientology working. And in that, Hubbard makes no bones about, I'd rather have you dead than in competent or incapable as a Scientologist and you're better, you know, this is the, the inculcated mindset of Scientology that you're 100% Scientology, 100% what L. Ron Hubbard says is absolute word of God truth and not to be questioned, only to be read, duplicated and applied. And that goes for all of this stuff about the the handling of enemies. And like I said, though it's not as broadly available as his, you know, Dianetics or other books. Well, it's fundamentally it secret. It's you know, much of it is issued only. I mean, as a nine year member, I did through OT five. I was trained class two. I had no idea of the HCO Manual of Justice. And these Correct. Horrible things, <laughs> or, or the or these references. But what is astonishing about them is that when you read them, you go, "Well, this sort of aligns with everything else that you know." This aligns with critics of Scientology, which is a magazine article that he published to everyone, saying the critics of Scientology have have sordid crimes and. 
you know, that that the future of, of every man, woman, and child on this planet agonized is... Agonized future. Remember, it's going to be agonized whether you've got Scientology right. or not. Right. It is dependent upon what we do here and now in Scientology and blah, 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 like blah, Mrs. blah. Mrs. Patty Cake and... Nambi so Pambi this stuff, stuff is not... This, this stuff, when you read it, doesn't come as a surprise. That's sort of my point, is it, though it's secret and confidential and kept from everybody other than the people who are in the Office of Special Affairs, uh, except now it's all available on the internet, but... Well, I'm, I'm not, Chris Owen and I are not taking any responsibility for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's been available on the internet since 1996. It's just whether people bother to look for it, you know. I know, but uh, my my point was these things are not, though they're shocking, they're not inconsistent, and they're not shocking that this is part of Scientology. They're shocking that anybody would put such a thing in writing. I mean, the the insanity of this is that Scientology unlike anything else that I know, has these issues and has a policy that says you have to follow what L. Ron Hubbard says, and here is some writing of L. Ron Hubbard, and this is what you must do. And they try and, and sort of dance around that, but really can't. They, they will always admit and always acknowledge that L. Ron Hubbard is source, that L. Ron Hubbard is the founder, that you're supposed to follow what he says, blah, 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 blah. When, and then when you pull these things out and say, well, what about this one? Um, well, and it's hard to repudiate then the, the position that they've taken with respect to everything else. You know, so when you read this, you... And I wanted to read a couple of things out of it because I think it's like really so important. So I'm still on this counterattack tactics and it says bright idea. One, these persons can always lose their jobs. This is a point of vulnerability in all caps. If two, if the person's job is not valuable to him or if he cannot be made to cost his job, something can be found which he is seeking to protect, and it can be threatened. Evolved operating principles in all caps. A. Counterattack to obtain the removal of the person with a product of dismissed attacker. B. If on test A is not feasible, Survey to find what the person considers valuable and use it for restraint. At once, swiftly draw up a precise program using intelligence principles and cross-filing to isolate the attacker. Identify the instigator. When identified, or even suspected as the instigator, Draw up a project which includes at least three channels to cost him his job. Draw up a second project at once to survey and discover what the person really is defending and threaten it effectively. Now, this, this is the basis of the infamous three-channel handling of the Guardian's Office and Office of Special Affairs, which is, as Hubbard describes, figure out three different avenues to pursue to cost the person his job and threaten what is important or he is seeking to protect. Those two things, cost him his job, threaten what he is seeking to protect, are the essence of Scientology, how do you destroy an enemy? How do you create a dismissed attacker is what it's called. Now, let me give you the real killer. This one is called Intelligence Principles, also on 28 March 1972. And I am going to read you an example that Hubbard gives about, I, I'm not going to read this whole thing. It talks a lot about um, 
this is how you go about doing things. But he says, here's an example. And in typical Hubbard fashion, uses weird names. Gosh Porge is located as an antagonistic source in the Bureau of Mines. Study the Bureau of Mines. They frown on corrupt and bankrupt employees. It is carefully worked out by survey. Gosh Porge receives a check for 250 pounds from the Aluminum Company of America at his office for, quote, tip-off and patent sent, unquote, and, quote, his wife, unquote, runs up fur coat bills at Harrods who sue and, quote, a man in Soho, unquote, wants his 1,800 pounds gambling debt and, quote, a mistress, unquote, calls his boss and demands the return of her diamonds, quote, gosh borrowed, unquote, and as it keeps up, even gosh porges best denials won't prevent his being sacked. That is how you go about framing someone. And that's exactly what that is saying to do. It does not say find the crimes. It says create the crimes. Have strange his mistress call. Have this happen. Have that happen. All in inverted commas. These things are, are created. It's a, Here's another one. Without consulting legal bureau, Bish Schmish is suing C of S for truckloads. Survey his attorneys covertly. One finds they detest, quote, people from the city, unquote, very prejudiced against money clauses. So city blokes start appearing on their lines for Bish Schmish. Will he win the suit? Broker wants to know, can Bish Schmish cover his margins? City bowler hat beats up lawyer with an umbrella because Bish Smish said he was going to get the lawyer to sue him over the, quote, blocks of stock, unquote, Bish Smish swindled. Keep it up. Soon he won't have any lawyer. This is, th this, and I don't think people really understand this, that Hubbard said they have these critic publicly he said critics have crimes publicly he said you can guarantee it publicly he said just accuse them of it even if you don't know what it is because it's going to be true the secret documents say create these crimes yeah and find, there is another find little create yeah. yeah there is another little uh mention where it says uh and the word slipped my mind. He says, manufacture it. Manufacture, manufacture it. enough threat. Enough threat. And this is how Scientology goes about dealing with enemies of Scientology. Well, let, let me interject. I was accused uh, through rumor, through printed material uh, of rape, attempted murder, uh, drug dealing, heroin addiction. Uh, child molesting, this just kept on coming over a period of time. The only good thing was that once you've developed a reputation as a critic of Scientology, people don't believe anything negative that's said about you. So even if right. it were true, it, it goes the wrong way. So I was able to survive for a dozen years with the onslaught of, of this campaign. Right. And, and those campaigns are very deliberately created and you know you ask me about uh do i you know do i have any specifics look i brought along this thing which has been on the internet before that is called the bd handling program and it is about chuck Beatty, and it is <laughs> it's funny it it's uh, it, and this is from 2006 and it says, the major targets, crimes on Beatty found and documented, Chuck Beatty dismissed as an attacker or totally restrained and muzzled. And it goes through talking at great length about 
getting people to start rumors about him, that he's a pedophile, contacting the people that he works for, uh, creating phony people on the internet to uh, attack him and claim that he's, you know, doing this, doing that, registering truth about Beatty.org website. This lays out get him sent materials and URLs for sex locations on the internet. You know, this stuff is, is fair game in action. And that's why Leah and I call our podcast the Fair Game Podcast. Because as you well know, John, Scientology claims that fair game no longer exists or never existed, or I've only ever heard it from critics of Scientology, which is complete horseshit. I mean, fair game was written by L. Ron Hubbard pursuant to the exact same ideas that I just read out from these references, which is destroy anybody who is against Scientology. And in fact, fair game began because Hubbard was upset that there were squirrels, people who had taken his materials and were using them and selling them without giving the money to him. That was the, the, the original start of Fair Game was how to destroy the squirrels. The, the, the first instance that, that I know of it is a man called James Elliott, who is listed on Hubbard's uh, letterhead as his business manager in 1951, stealing the mailing lists of the Kansas organization, to which Hubbard wrote over 30 letters attacking Don Purcell, who had bailed him out of his bankruptcy. That's the first, you know, but I imagine that Fair Game with Hubbard probably goes back into his teens, frankly. Oh, it's yes. just I, an operating I, I'm just talking there. about the formalized yep, use of it's formalized of in the term. 60s because he's annoyed that people are making money without paying the 10%. But even that, right. in 1955, when we're born, you've got um, the Scientologist to Dissemination of Material, where he talks about ruining utterly anybody who doesn't have a license, i.e. doesn't pay their 10% to him. So right. it's his modus operandi. It's how he thinks. It's how he works. Ex exactly. But I, I just wanted to to, to um, give you a, a, a concrete example that this is exactly what happens. And you can see, you know, I watch what Scientology does and says, and, you know, I'm now the perfect metaphor for how they – go about seeking to destroy enemies. Like they protest at Disney and A&E, fire Mike Rinder, fire Mike Rinder. They have websites saying, I'm a wife beater, I'm a child molester, I'm a this, I'm a that. All of these things, they're not, there is nothing different about Scientology today than there was Scientology in 2006 or Scientology in 1969. And the reason that it isn't different is because it can't change because it is, it, it is hammered, chiseled into concrete or stainless steel or titanium or something that the words of L. Ron Hubbard are the words of scripture of Scientology. So if L. Ron Hubbard says, destroy your enemies, they will continue to seek to destroy their enemies, or what they call their enemies, in exactly the same fashion as they always have. And when, this, when L. Ron Hubbard says that after conservation comes decay and death, <laughs> that also may happen, you know. Um, right. We, we, but exactly, I've often said, as soon as it's elevated as a religious scripture that is infallible and that may not be changed and only Elrond Hubbard's word is valid, you then go to the policy letter called Technical Degrades, which is as essential as keeping Scientology working, which says you can't change anything. And even if the dates of two issues which are in conflict, you don't take the more recent one. They're both true. So when he says you always give a refund to anybody who wants the money back, and another issue says you never give a refund, both of those are scripturally true, and you have to do them both. <laughs> and that is the nature of Scientology, the double bind where you're stuck between these contradictions. On a day when he's happy, 
the, you know, in his bipolar condition, he's pleasant. You know, on a day when he's unhappy, he's unpleasant. There's a peculiar example of this in the policy letters called Attacks on Scientology, which is, I think, February 66, just before the founding of the Guardian's office. And there are four of them, and they all have the same name. One is Broad Public Issue, and it says, Advocate Total Freedom. And as you right. go down through the listing... <laughs> And eventually, on March the 1st, you get what is greatness, which is that you, that you never do anything horrible to people, you know. It's like, yeah, really. So you've, you've got this split personality at the very heart of Scientology. The one, and, and one of the things that shocks me is that people, when I came away from it, I read all of this stuff about Hubbard. I left as totally devoted. I left because mm -hmm. I was devoted to Scientology. I wanted to save it from the likes of David Miscavige. I didn't realise that Hubbard was still running it in 1983, which I'm now confident he was. But within a few months of leaving, I had this stack of documents uh, gathered by a guy called Michael Lynn Shannon. Uh, and it, it was irrefutable. Hubbard was a liar. There was, you know, since after that, I started showing that his own contradictions are there. You know, there's... Uh, 23rd September 1950 lecture called Introduction to Dianetics, where he actually tells the truth about his background. He's not a war hero. He dropped out of college. He failed his molecular and atomic physics, not nuclear physics. It's all in there. Those contradictions, the man was a liar. Now, the road to truth must be trod with true steps. Honesty is sanity. These are two R. Ron Hubbard statements. He was dishonest, therefore insane by his own and he was untruthful, so therefore didn't know the road to truth. So for me, it was very easy then to reject Scientology. What shocked me was that almost nobody I knew, and by then I knew hundreds of people, was willing to do the same. They all, well, yes, he was an evil man who did terrible things, but this is the way to immortality and life following his... And that conflict still staggers me that people can find themselves caught in that that somebody was a very devil in real life, but they only had good intentions. You know, it's right. like saying Hitler really did, was a really nice man. You know, I mean, he was a vegetarian, let's face it. You know, <laughs> he built beautiful roads, you know. So we shouldn't be too. And, and having said he that. He even painted. Yeah, a whole afternoon, two coats. Uh, one, one apartment, one afternoon. Uh, fabulous dancer too. And on that point, there's actually a textbook, which I'm pretty sure Hubbard used. And it's a book called Hitler Speaks. And it was written by Hermann Rauschning. It was a popular book in 1938 when it was published. Um, Rauschning had been the head of the Danzig Senate. He was the president of the Danzig Senate, which was a free city, Gdansk now. Um, he was the first elected Nazi leader. And he used to go and spend his weekends with Hitler before Hitler became chancellor through the late 20s, early 30s. And he writes, he fled to England in 38 because he said he's going to kill the Jews. And that was never what I signed up for. He is going to exterminate the Jews. So all of these arguments about whether the Van Sea conference, Hitler knew anything about it. In 38, a guy who knew him well is saying this is what he's saying. This book is Hitler's table talk. And in it, he talks about you have to have an enemy if you want to have a group. You, We will follow the Jesuits in our organisation and the Freemasons in our, our levels of you know, initiation. Scientology is very much based upon a reading of this book. Nibs Hubbard, of course, Hubbard's oldest son, really believed and said that his father got the magic from the same guy that gave it Hitler. Well, I think the magic was this book, plus Alistair Crowley, out of which we get many of the ideas of Scientology, like um, the trauma of birth or past lives, um, training routine uh, zero with your eyes closed. These are things that come directly from Crowley. We get this mixture of things and this... I'm confused still as to what Hubbard's intention was. I th um, the closest I've got to it is Charlie Nairn, who made The Shrinking World of Aaron Hubbard in 1968, which is still the only hostile interview with Ron Hubbard, right. which he fails in very badly. You know, I had no second wife. I had a first wife and a third <laughs> wife. There are no Swiss. There is one Swiss bank again. Uh, do I believe in reincarnation? Let me think about that. Do your followers believe in it? Oh, yes, they do, for sure. Um, but Charlie said that before he... Talk, you know, he's always regretted that this, that before he talked with Hubbard, they, they talked for an hour in the small hours of the morning. He started filming about four in the morning. 
And he said, he said to Hubbard, it's a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard said, oh, yes, of course it's a scam. <laughs> what? And he said, why do you do it? It must be terribly lonely for you, you know, having to keep this hidden all the time. And Hubbard was, yeah, sympathise with me. You know, it's, it's awful. So why do you do it? Because it's good telling your wife every night we made $10,000 today, which is would be an enormous amount of money in, you know, today. But the main reason is I like to catch the clever ones and reel them in. And you suddenly see that you're, you're dealing with a 10-year-old. You're dealing with somebody who's never grown up, who's going to get revenge on the other kids because they were horrid to him. And that's about the development of his mentality. He never really becomes a human being. It's all a game that he's playing with everybody. Yeah, it, it's that's a very interesting take on that, John. I, you know, I've never heard anybody put it quite like that before. I find uh, I've been watching the the vow about Nexium and now uh, this other series called Seduced, and Keith Raniere is is a little uh, L. Ron Hubbard, David Miscavige clone, and what is so fascinating about that particular series is that Mark Vicente was documenting all these discussions that they were having because Ranieri was so, you know, so caught up with himself that he wanted everything that he said to be recorded, just yes. like L. Ron Hubbard oh, yeah, and David Miscavige. Word. But the difference is, all of the recordings of L. Ron Hubbard that the messengers were standing there with, you know, little tape recorders or David Miscavige, they're all transcribed in millions of pages of stuff that's held in the RTC building. They're not available to the public, but that footage of Keith Ranieri is, and it was used particularly effectively in the vow to show the mindset of a, of a man like that. And that is exactly what you just said. I like to, to, you know, think that I can reel in or trick or, or cheat the smartest people around because that proves I'm smarter than all of them. And this is all a sort of a game to me of... See, I've always viewed this as the the reason that Hubbard did what he did, and now the reason that Miscavige does what he did, does, is power, and that power is a is a a drug that can never be, you, you know, you never get fully satisfied. The more you have of it, the more you want. Which and is that, the same with any addictive drug, that you have to keep taking more to get some kind of effect. Absolutely. And that power is measured by both Hubbard and Miscavige, not strictly by the amount of money that they are able to get, but how much they are able to get people to do things that are against their best interests. To me, that is the ultimate definition of power. If you have power over someone, you can you can get them by means of persuasion, coercion, whatever form it takes to do things that aren't in their best interest. And that includes giving you money. I mean, Scientology manages to get people to give them money that they go into horrific debt to accomplish. And there's no evidence that it gets used for anything good, but they give it over anyway. They go into bankruptcy. They lose their houses. They've got massive credit card debt, except their children can't go to college, all of this stuff. And that is ultimate power, the ability to get someone to give up their life for you, to live in the hole, to do outrageous things on your behalf that they wouldn't normally or necessarily do. Um, that is intoxicating. And, there are, and uh, there are elements of that within Scientology's own technology. The, the most evident one is the, the so-called upper indoctrination, interesting use of the word TRs. They were developed on a, a, a congress in, I think, 1957. And the original issues assigned Elrond Hubbard Jr. And the word 
Jr. was taken off. And according to L. Ron Hubbard Jr., Nibs, what happened was that they had some rowdy students. And so his father said, find some way of controlling them. Find some way of... And he would apparently quite frequently say, I wonder if we can get people to do this. Now, what, what is being done in those drills is that you are controlling a person. You are learning how to physically exert control. But when you get to training routine eight, anybody that sees that demonstrated, you know, you are shouting at an ashtray to learn what intention is. So you've been pushed into this comedy. The same is true with TR1 and TR2, that you're reading out, you know, off with his head. It's become a way of making people do absurd things. There is a key to this for me. On the Philadelphia doctorate course, you know, you could get the doctorate by sitting and listening to Elrond Hubbard for six weeks. Um, $500, 38 people did it. In that course, he reveals so much. One of the things he says is, in it, you have, play, you have pieces in a game. Life is a game. You have pieces in a game. They must never know the rules. Right. right. You have a player. And his job is to keep the rules hidden from the pieces. So you go, well, that's David Miscavige now. But then you have the game maker. And the thing he says about the game maker is the game maker doesn't have to follow the rules. If Ron Hubbard wanted to stop in the middle of an auditing session and tell his auditor something, and I've interviewed enough of his auditors to know about this, he could do it. He could control a session. If he wanted to have a drink while he was having a session, he could do it. When he came to the, when I interviewed David Mayer about the OT5, the New Era Dynetics for OTs material, I couldn't actually publicly say what David told me because it would have interfered with the court case that Scientology had against him because the claim being made was that David had written those materials. But David admitted to me that he didn't. What he admitted to me is that he'd be doing something with Hubbard which was about misownership of ideas, not about having body thetans. And Hubbard would stop him and say, write this down. <laughs> and David got to write down the bulletins. So years went by, but, you know, I actually waited until David had passed before I went public with this, just in case, you know, I knew what threat he was under. And I respect him, though I think he became incredibly confused about what he was doing. And ultimately, of course, rejected Scientology completely after so many years of involvement with it. But that thing of, you know, Hubbard was the game maker. He could do what the hell he liked. But he was the only person who could ever discover a philosophical premise, an idea, or a technique. No one else would ever. So it didn't matter how, you know, godly you became, how, how much of an operating thing you, you became. You'd never be able to discover anything. You'd never right. be able to originate <laughs> anything. You'd always be part of his solipsistic dream because he was the game maker and you were one of the pieces. And ever more yeah, yeah. shall be so. You know, self-determinism would be doing what Ron said. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, exactly right. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thinking, thinking for, for yourself. yourself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I just realized that Ron was right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. What fun we've had. Yes, yes, we have. We have. Um, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, John, John I, I have, have to, to, to uh, bid you farewell. farewell. Um, um, I, I would, would love, love to come back and talk to you some more, though. though. Oh, I, yes, I mean, this, this has been absolutely great. I've really enjoyed it. it. It's great to talk to somebody who has, you know, thought about it and arrived at some conclusions about it and, you know, that we can agree and, you know, open up the field a little bit more to people who have not had the luxury of, Spending years <laughs> immersed in this complete nonsense, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, it's a, it's been a real, truly a real pleasure. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Just just as I thoroughly enjoy the conversations that I have with everybody who, just like you said, who has taken the time to sort of stand back and look and and try and analyze and think about. What 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 really was this? What was I in? And how do I look at it now? And how do I present or try and present it to others so that they may not fall into the same hole that I fell into at one point? And I think that that's a, a very admirable thing to do because it, it it it's very easy to go. I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. I'm done. That was a chapter of my life that I want to 
Barry. I I want to move on. I want to never think about it again and be done with it. And there are plenty of people who have done that. And I understand why they would, but I really respect people who have the the cojones to stick at it and keep trying to put an end to what they know are abuses that are happening to to people, you know, you have no vested interest in this at this point, John. No. Neither does Chris <laughs> Owen, neither does Chris opposite. Shelton, neither does all Tiny. the other people who are out there who who work away at trying to to expose the truth. And I want to thank you for that and for what you have done over such a long period because you've stuck to it and your stick to itiveness is very, very admirable. Well, thank you. I mean, there is a particular point for me, and, and that is that you can't walk away from this. If you think you can, you're wrong. This is the most devastating invasion of the human mind. This is real mind snatching. And if you walk away from it, you know, I, years ago, I interviewed um, Terry Gleason, who'd been the executive director international. I had dinner with him. At the end of dinner, I said, what do you think of Scientology? And his whole statement was, I think it's shit. Now, the point is that he was still making his living selling the so-called administration <laughs> technology, and he didn't see this conflict. What tends to happen is that people will replace the words of Scientology, but they'll maintain the concepts. They'll still believe in the suppressive person. They'll still believe in karma now, which used, karma vipaka, which used to be the overt motivator sequence. For anybody leaving any authoritarian group, it's necessary to examine what you believe. And I said when I left Scientology, I'm re rejecting it all. I'll examine it piecemeal and see which bits of it make sense to me. It's 37 years later. There is absolutely nothing in Scientology that I can't find a better source for. Because, of course, I found 120 different sources for Scientology ideas. And the people who expressed them before Hubbard took them and alter is them, entered a lie into them so they would persist in his terms, before they had a better idea than he did. And he himself said you should go to the original text. So you know, my first example of this was reading uh, Positioning the Battle for Your Mind by recent Trout, right. Right. just after I'd got in, because I read the marketing series, and Hubbard said, oh, we'll read this original book. I read the book and he said, he's not understood it. And so for me, that, that was a good thing, because I did go and but you have to examine the dogma, the doctrine. Do I still believe that? And if you do, fine, absolutely fine. But if you don't examine it, it owns you, you know? So that's, that's why I came back in 2013, because I was meeting people who were 20 years out. They weren't independents. They were just people who'd been involved 20 years before. Right. Right. And their lives were crippled by these in, you know, insidious, invidious ideas of Warren Hubbard. Still, end of rant. <laughs> it's been a great <laughs> pleasure. This is it's my good friend now, Mike Rinder, and we will talk again soon. I'm John Atak. Thank you for watching. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. From your little house in Nottingham, you were going to destroy the world. Yes. I know. <laughs>